All right, let's get started. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for coming out. Uh, thanks for sticking around. I think we've got a pretty cool story to tell you guys here today. Um, going to give you a little rundown about how we kind of built out our platform team, give you a perspective from that side. Uh, what we did to start onboarding all the teams to ultimately get ready for a pretty cool, uh, pretty, pretty cool experience uh, going through our first holiday season on Pivotal Cloud Foundry. My name is Nick Bellamer. I'm the engineering manager for the platform team. Um, I've been with the Dix organization for uh, five years now, almost five years. Uh, previously, I came from about nine years' experience doing uh, information security and compliance work. So it was a pretty interesting jump going from that world to this world. Uh, I've been learning a lot, but I've been in this uh, role for about a year now. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Samir Hashmi. I'm a senior platform architect at Pivotal. I come from an app dev background, and as a Java developer, I've been developing applications from GSP serverless to microservices. With Pivotal, for the last one year, I've been working with large enterprises and organizations like Dick Sporting Goods. And my main key role was to enable and onboard them to Pivotal Cloud Foundry. And so far, it has been an amazing journey. The, the transformation we have done in the last 11 months, that's, that's incredible to see. And that is what we'll be walking you through today. So quickly going through the agenda first. We have divided our talk into two key sections. The first section, we talk about all the struggle and challenges that were faced within the organization and how those things change after adopting Cloud Foundry. In the second part, we'll talk about the holiday season. The very first thing is that how we prepared for it, how did the platform operate at scale, and second thing that what were the key incidents where we had few uh, mini heart attacks and we were just tackling those without impacting any business applications. At the end, we'll be having a quick retro, next steps, uh, what were the key lessons that we learned, and we'll take questions at the end. So jumping to transformation and onboarding story. So to kind of paint a picture about how things were before uh, we began making this transformation, uh, the old way of working really resulted in um, some siloed groups, um, not a whole lot of collaboration, cross-collaboration across those groups. You can kind of see the picture. It was really a lot of throwing things over the wall, um, not really owning uh, what you were creating. Uh, Coming from a security background, I was pretty familiar with the security patch processes and what it took to actually accomplish those, uh, th those tasks through the month-to-month -month, uh, activities that we had to complete. Um, we had to integrate a lot with the network engineering team, the uh, Windows engineering team, Unix engineering team. We had to find the downstream applications that were affected by these patches, and then the security team would be involved. All this was bringing a lot of people to the table on a month-to-month -month basis and burning a lot of time and energy trying to accomplish something that should be relatively straightforward. Our change management cycles uh, were pretty long as well. Uh, we had a pretty rigorous uh, uh, change advisory board that would meet on a weekly basis and basically approve or reject different changes. There were all, there was all sorts of paperwork that was associated with that. It was really a hindrance to uh, product teams or applications moving forward with solutions that ultimately would provide uh, value back to our customers. Infrastructure was also sized uh, beyond what we really needed on a day-to-day -day basis, except for maybe five days out of the year. Um, that, that infrastructure was running hot uh, around the, throughout the year, so we were really burning a lot of, uh, a lot of money, a lot of uh, maintenance, a lot of time from teams managing that equipment. Uh, and that cost kind of built up. For five days out of the year, we had exactly what we needed, but for 360 days, we had three, four, five times as much resources as we actually needed. So it was a uh, huge waste of money. We were also a bi-culture. Uh, living in the siloed environments that we had throughout DSG, uh, we'd find teams looking for solutions to problems, uh, reaching out to vendors themselves, and potentially identifying solutions that might have been able to be addressed across the organization and solve problems for this team and this team. Instead, you ended up with a solution for this team and a solution for this team, two vendors that potentially could be competing with each other, providing the same service. A good example of this was uh, our address verification system. This was one of the components that was recently transitioned over to the uh, PCF environment. So I think there were nine different address verification systems, making sure that we could get product from point A to point B, and it, the address was correct. Nine different systems to do the same thing. Uh, we had a pretty cool uh, uh, opportunity with our shipping team to build out a, uh, an on-prem solution using PCF to actually solve that problem and do away with those unnecessary systems. Fast forward to where we are today. Um, it's a much better environment, uh, at least over the last 11 months that we've been doing this. 
But we really wanted to focus on a couple of things. We wanted to make sure that we were focusing our customers and re refocusing our efforts on ensuring that they were receiving value out of what we were delivering. We wanted to leverage the meaningful technology that we were creating to make sure that they were providing services and things to the customers that they actually wanted and in a timely manner, not something where three, four weeks from a request coming in that something was delivered and now they have to go and check to make sure it actually um, achieves what they were looking to accomplish uh, by making that request. We wanted to drive those efficiencies down into our back-end process as well. So instead, uh, we, we wanted to make sure that what we were doing day-to-day -day in, the, in the office was also not wasting time in getting that information and solution out to the customer. Um, so Paul Gaffney joined the organization about a year ago, and he brought with him some pretty good vision uh, to change the way that we do things. And I give him credit, but I think the real credit is in the teams that were able to adopt what he was trying to present. We had, like I said, the old way of working in that siloed uh, organization. We had a bunch of teams that kind of rose to the occasion and uh, really adopted what he was after. And through that, we were able to implement some pretty cool things. We were able to isolate components of our e-com environment uh, in time for our uh, holiday season, which we'll get to in a little bit. And uh, if you caught the Wall Street Journal, um, he was pretty excited to present that we're going to continue to move some of those things uh, into our PCF environment. And I think we have the, the right team to do that. So he also brought the, uh, the Cloud Foundry idea to, um, to exporting goods. Uh, it, was, it was just an option. It was a way of working. Uh, he brought, um, he had one team do a proof of value um, against uh, whether or not this is actually going to work. And uh, they were able to deliver a result in uh, six weeks, I think, from the time of conception. And to your point, Nick, uh, this proof of value project was very crucial at that point of time. Because that was, a where, that was the point where the developers, they started to see the real value of Cloud Foundry. How they were pushing their applications without even thinking that they have to figure out load balancers or SSLs or DNS routes. They had a marketplace where they can self-sufficient all those services that they want to use, whether it's RabbitMQ or whether they're MySQL services. So, so that was one of the critical points where, where they saw the value. One of the other things that we were focused from day one was how to measure success. So success was us make, making sure that where they stand right now, getting those numbers in baselines, doing, uh, doing a deep value analysis, stream analysis on them. And then when Build Cloud Foundry has been implemented, what is the success looks afterwards? How long does it take for you to patch uh, security patch, How? what is the time for mean time to repair? So there's a slide uh, later in the deck where Nick will walk through those quick pins as well. One of the other focus point was to eliminate all the manual steps. So there was, as Nick said earlier, that there was manual steps and there was a lot of handoffs between developers and operators whenever they had to release any features. So the, the idea was to automate everything that we can, not only for the developers so that they can release their features, but also for the platform team so that they can evolve the product as a platform. And for that, we needed a platform team. So that was the first thing that was created uh, within the exporting was in early May. Uh, and there was some product marketing was done as well. So Nick, if you can just tell how did you came up with the name Stad? Yeah, so we're a sporting goods company, and uh, we root a lot of our uh, analogies in uh, sporting environment. Uh, Stod is the root word for stadium, and in the same way that baseball players, football players all come to the stadium to play their game, we wanted to create an, an environment that uh, development teams could come and play theirs. So it really gave us a, a, place to, a central place to come together, um, and they can do some pretty cool things there. And as per the definition, you know, uh, platform was the one place where, which can take all the workloads running within the organization. And uh, one of the other things that was done uh, amazingly well by the leadership team was that they handpicked one expert from each domain. For example, one from DevOps, one from networking, one from security. They combined all those seven personas as one single team so that if there was an issue on the security side, that one person can resolve that issue instead of he going out and, you know, delaying all those, uh, th the time for, for that issue. Uh, as of today, uh, within 11 months, that one platform team consists of those seven persons. Those seven are running seven foundations in different ISs. Uh, that those seven foundations are serving hundreds of developers, which comprise of 40 product teams. And the idea is to go more than that. Uh, keep in, keep, keeping that in mind that at that point of time, these seven platform engineers were new to Cloud Foundry. And they not only have to implement an enterprise-grade solution within the organization, but also to onboard these 40 product teams. I think that was 
piece of cake or like it was easy oh, yeah. for us? Really easy. We recognized pretty early on uh, the importance of automation. Um, we made that transition from siloed teams to balanced product teams, uh, and it gave, it gave us the route for uh, how this, this whole environment was going to be built out. Uh, from a platform perspective, though, it was, it was extremely important to automate that onboarding process so that those 40 or 45 teams that were being spun up so quickly had the same experience and same opportunity to roll out their new solutions. So we, we spent a lot of time doing that. We wanted to make sure that uh, across those seven environments, the teams were getting the same amount of access across those so they can make the decision to deploy to this IaaS or this IaaS. Uh, we use a lot of tools like Vault and Concourse, and those are all built into the same automation. So we literally kick off a script, provide an Active Directory group, and that provisions the entire base of the foundation and everything that the teams are going to need to actually be onboarded to our foundations. Early on, we conducted a lot of 101 reviews, too. Uh, it was new for us, so it gave us a chance to reiterate and relearn what we were supposed to already know at that point, uh, month one. Um, but it also gave us a chance to share that knowledge with other teams. And as the teams began to grow, we went from 10 to 15 to 30 teams and ultimately to 40. We started seeing a shift in the collaboration between the teams, and they were, to help, they were helping. There was a community uh, through Confluence that... Uh, people were produ producing all sorts of uh, documentation for teams to be using, and it was really making our life easier from this perspective so we could focus on building the next great thing from a platform perspective. And while we were conducting these 101 uh, with specific product teams, we thought that it was very important to conduct trainings and workshops for the entire developer set, either it's a Java site or it's a .NET site. So what we did was that uh, by conducting these trainings and workshops, the idea was to make sure that the DSD developers not only know how to write a microservice or how to use those cloud native design patterns like circuit breakers or config servers or service discovery, but also know the real background, what happens when a CF push happens? You know, what is the staging process? How the droplet is created? If they want to log some uh, log uh, for their applications out to any log aggregator uh, system, how to use log, log aggregator for that? What are the different four levels of high availability? The concept of AIs and SIs were totally new to them, and the concept of auto-scaling was also new. So to teach them how to use the auto-scaling, how to configure them right, which was a very important factor going through the holiday season. On the side, there's another chart which shows the growth of the number of AIs that Dick Sporingos had gone through. If you see in there, May is the time when the platform is set up. The very first bump came from June to July, and that was the time where we were conducting all these workshops and one-on-ones. <coughs> The next bump was uh, from October to November, where we asked the applications team to do their load testing and scale out their applications for the holiday season. We don't get a lot of credit for the actual steps that were happening after November, because there was actually a scale-down event from holiday. We were actually able to leverage a lot of that auto-scaling and uh, lower the number of instances and uh, infrastructure that needed to support the environment, because we were no longer running at that holiday peak scale. So you see the slight steps in there, but there's probably a little greater growth um, between November and December. But the even better story of all this is prior to having this in our environment, there was a freeze period towards the end of the year. We could not touch systems, and the idea of deploying new things to the foundation or to any environment uh, was almost unheard of. So seeing that continued step growth and that uh, really that larger growth that would have happened between November and December uh, is kind of a cool, cool story to tell for uh, some of the changes that have happened since adopting Cloud Foundry. <clears throat> this might look a little familiar. Uh, Jason presented something similar to this uh, in a previous uh, talk, uh, but we're seeing a lot of the same productivity uh, in the teams, even as we're onboarding more teams. We're seeing increases in productivity, uh, dev to ops ratio 120 to 7, uh, and then next to no time spent doing any security patches. Me being the security guy, I want to make sure I point that out. This is a small snapshot, small look into uh, what things might have looked like for old releases uh, for, during the old way of doing things. Uh, it involved getting a lot of people into a room. Uh, sometimes this would happen on nights or weekends, and it was probably not the best work environment to uh, really enjoy. <laughs> And certainly things have changed after this, after implementing Cloud Foundry. Now the developers are deploying their features without any downtime, and the platform team is pushing all the upgrades and patches, again, with Canary-style deployment using Bosch. So we took a picture of that as well. And now they do the deployments <laughs> like this. So this was a real event. And what happened was that uh, our very own Nick, the platform owner, he pushed a major upgrade of PCF from 2.1 to 2.2, 
while the other person, Rick, who is an engineering manager of multiple product teams, he had multiple workloads running on the foundation. He didn't got any alert or notification that you know there's a patch going on or there was an upgrade going on. So that was another benefit. You know, you, you got your weekends back with this. Yep. And then this is our value summary. Um, when we took a look at adopting this uh, technology, we took a look at what this was going to do for developer productivity. We wanted to make sure that what we were putting out there into DSG for these teams to use it, they were going to be able to leverage it and return value on what they were working through. Uh, we spent some time looking at the operational efficiency of the number of users or the number of uh, operators that it's going to take to support this. And I think we see some pretty immediate uh, return on that, knowing that we've got a platform of seven operate, platform team of seven operators versus what we would traditionally need for a normal environment. And then infrastructure and cost avoidance. There's a huge opportunity here for us. As we continue to offload some of the legacy applications, the monolithic applications that exist in our current environment, and break down some of the reliance that we have on third-party vendors, uh, we're going to start seeing costs there shift down as well. And that leads us to the holiday. So we did all this work um, in about five months. By the time we started and by the time the holiday season hit, it was only a five-month period. Um, our holiday time is probably one of the most critical times. We do a significant portion of our year's business during this period. So any hiccups, any problems um, result in um, some fun conversations that we would like to avoid having forever. Um, so what did we do to pre prepare for this? This was new for us. Uh, this is the first time we are going through as a platform team the holiday season. Uh, we, 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 start, we focused first on the IaaS infrastructure, the things that lived outside of PCF but were critical to our environment, and that was mainly the load balancers. So we met with teams, made sure that those were configured correctly. Then we moved into the scaling of the uh, PCF components, Diego cells, log aggregators, Go routers. Um, I'll get into how we failed miserably there later. Um, learned a lot in that process, though. And then we reviewed the Go router configurations, making sure that um, they were sized appropriately, can handle what we thought might be uh, reasonable traffic through holiday. PCF health watch alerts uh, were also configured. We wanted to make sure that those were tuned appropriately. We integrate all of our monitoring through Microsoft Teams, and we wanted to get rid of any uh, alerts that might um, be noise to us. We wanted to make sure whatever was coming to us was actionable and that we weren't wasting time looking at things that didn't make sense. And then we expanded work quotas. Uh, I think a lot of teams were unsure of what to expect on PCF going through holiday. They knew what it was like in the old environment, but we were taking wild guesses to say, yeah, sure, I need 500 gigabytes of quota, or I need this, or I need that. We were taking guesses, and um, we, we guessed all right. <laughs> So while that was going on at uh, Dick's Sporting Goods, what we did at the Pivotal side that we as a balance account team, we reached out to multiple product teams within Pivotal. The idea was to get an idea of what are the best practices, the right configuration, and what are the key components to monitor when we hit the, that high peak or you know when we get all those number of requests. We talked to Team Diego, Log Regator, PCF Metrics, HealthWatch, uh, Go Routers, uh, and uh, even cloud controllers as well, just to make sure that you're, we are doing all the best practices. The output of that was a 10-page document in which we have 30 more than contributors from the Pivotal side, which was shared with the exporting goods, just to make sure that, okay, these are the right things, these are the right metrics, these are the right monitors that we have to watch out. The other thing that we did was we created a checklist for the developer team, and we rotated that for each dev teams. Few of the items in that dev team was how to, how to manage scaling. The very first thing that we said that manually scale your applications right before and then let the autoscaler kick in so that we don't want to hit any of the performance issues even if it's for milliseconds. Other item was to make sure that they're implementing circuit breakers right. They have their fallback mechanism. If something fails, they are properly showing a proper error message to that. Another thing was to have their application load and performance test very well, because that was a very critical uh, uh, point that we faced earlier when we were there in uh, Cyber Five Days. The last point to mention out here was, it was a great to see the Cloud Foundry community coming together when the exporting platform team and T-Mobile platform team, they exchanged notes with, uh, with each other. T-Mobile, uh, uh, an experienced Cloud Foundry user, they have been using it for their iPhone release launches. And we want to make sure that we want to pick their brain that what are the key things that they saw when they hit that uh, spike. So that was one of the things that, uh, that was helpful very uh, in, the, in those five days.
<clears throat> Talking about the workloads on Cloud Foundry. So Dex Sporting Goods operate right now three main e-commerce sites. Dex Sporting Goods them as, uh, as well. Uh, Golf Galaxy, Feel and Stream. Whenever you hit for an e-commerce site, there are a few key components running on it, which is, for example, search, a uh, product display page. That was running on uh, PCF at that point of time in some capacity. Merck Search is another a success story with it uh, itself. It was a labs project which was developed within Pivotal Labs, and uh, it was meant to be run in store. That was also ready to take traffic uh, on PCF. So at this point of time, these are just few applications which are listed out there, but there are multiple applications which were ready to hit, uh, hit the traffic at that point of time. And there is Showtime. So what actually happened during holiday? Um, I think this, one, this was interesting for us uh, when we looked back at it, but uh, ultimately when we first started out, we wanted to make sure that going into holiday, we had information coming out of it about everything that went on. And uh, the team took to documenting everything, all the support calls, uh, all the tickets that were opened, anything that they changed on the fly, just so that when we go back next year and try to figure out what's, what needs to be sized differently, we have a good baseline for what a holiday season looks like. Uh, so Thanksgiving Day, so Cyber 5, let me explain Cyber 5 real quick, is the, time, the period of time between Thanksgiving and Cyber Monday. Uh, I had mentioned earlier we do a significant portion of our um, business through those years, or through, the, through those five days. Uh, it feels like years sometimes. Um, but Thanksgiving Day was really a warm up to uh, the main event. Uh, we had an on call rotation. It wasn't ideal, it was kind of an older way of doing things, and we're uh, focusing on uh, mitigating that for future uh, Cyber Fives. But we had seven guys uh, around the clock looking at these things, and it turned out to be a great learning experience. Uh, as you know, we were only on there for five months at this point, so uh, anything that we could get out of that, any uh, feedback from the system, from the environment, from the logs that, uh, for issues that we were running into were uh, critically important to understanding how this whole thing was going to work. Uh, we did identify a few misconfigurations early on, and we're happy to figure that out on Thanksgiving as opposed to Cyber, uh, Friday, or Cyber Monday or Black Friday. Uh, a lot of teams had auto scale enabled, they had it bound to their applications, but they didn't have rules configured. So we saw uh, pretty significant spikes in CPU utilization, we were able to catch those early, and uh, it was a good learning opportunity for the development teams too, so that um, they were aware of that for next year. We also did some scaling of components, um, I'll show you on the next slide that we should have scaled further. Uh, on Black Friday, we had our first support call, um, and we re realized that some of the health watch reporting uh, was unreliable. We actually, at 11.30 roughly, um, had a gap in uh, any logs coming over, and we had thought we lost the foundation. Being new to it, we didn't realize that it was the logging components that had fallen over, and uh, Pivotal Support was awesome about helping us through that. Uh, scaled a couple things that we had missed previously, uh, and we were able to get, get that back on track. But what's pretty cool about this piece is we were able to make all those changes in the middle of holiday on one of the busiest days of the year while the site was taking production traffic, which is, I mean, I, don't, I didn't work in e-com before, but I feel like that's an incredible feat to be able to accomplish during uh, one of your most important times of the year. We ran into some issues with PCF metrics also. Uh, again, worked with uh, support on this, and I think we identified some pretty cool uh, opportunities to improve documentation and improve our um, uh, run book for uh, how we go into holiday. Um, there were a couple components in there that failed that we just had to scale a little bit. I uh, did some uh, interesting things just to tweak uh, how that environment was running, and we were able to get through those five days uh, without too much of a problem. All in all, uh, it was a pretty successful holiday. Uh, we took, we saw a thousand plus, plus orders uh, a minute at some at, at periods of time, uh, and it raised significant confidence in the platform. I had a couple people after holiday come to me and made, make those comments that they feel pretty good about how things were running, how their apps were performing, and uh, I think that's going to help with that trend that we saw earlier as the apps can app instances continue to get deployed to the uh, foundations. Key results coming out of this, though, there was zero customer impact. We did not have any downtime uh, for the applications that were sitting on Cloud Foundry, which was a huge win for us. First year on the platform, um, the team did awesome with uh, working through those five days and not complaining too much. Um, partnering with Pivotal was really awesome. Uh, so the, the support team there, uh, 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 Scott's here, and <laughs> he's here too, he was a huge help. Um, but they've really transformed how we're building and running uh, software at Dick's Sporting Goods. 
Yes. Yeah, so quickly going through the retro that we had. No doubt it was a very successful event and there was no business impact, no application impact, but there was a lot of key learnings out of that. The very first thing that we saw that we have to plan that earlier because we, and last year we started in September and we thought that you know we are, we are delayed in the process. So this time what we'll plan is that we'll plan earlier, we'll, we'll reach out to those, all the product teams, making sure that they are doing all their, their checklists well before in time. Uh, as Nick said, that we, we reached out to the application teams talking about the auto-scaling configuration, but few of the teams were still lagging behind, and that's the reason we saw some of the CPU usage spikes. So what we'll do is we'll review the checklist again, we'll walk them through with all the dev teams, making sure that they're doing the load test, they're doing the performance test well ahead of time. Most importantly, we, we never catered the logs that were coming out of, out of uh, their applications, and that was the key things that we saw that PCF Health Watch or the log regator components falling off. Uh, what we are also designed to do more fire drills and implement chaos engineering. So that is one of the things that, okay, if some component goes down, there is no Im impact on any other microservices because this year we'll be expecting more microservices, more products on the platform team. And then the next thing that we need to address is the active active foundations. Uh, we were so early in the game that uh, when we were transitioning things over to the foundations, we still had the fallback plan of moving to the legacy hardware, the legacy environments. Um, so. Ideally, we'd be moving away from that. Uh, we need to get an active, active foundation so that we can support uh, peak load during uh, those critical times of the year. That's our story. We love it. Um, we're here for any questions if anyone has any. Go ahead. So uh, Samir had mentioned, uh, sorry, the question was uh, whether or not we were, do we have any mechanisms in place to perform load testing uh, to make sure that the developer is? Oh. Okay, got it. Question is, when developers are doing load testing, do we have any mechanisms for them to make us aware? Um, so we work pretty closely with all those teams. We have uh, Microsoft Teams channels that um, are actively communicating between teams. They're letting us know whenever they're doing things. Um, we have a sizable non-prod environment uh, away from production as well, and everything's terraformed and automated as far as those, uh, how those are deployed. So they, they do that testing in a lower environment, but against apps that are identical to what's in production. Hi, that was a very impressive zero customer impact number before. <laughs> We're proud so of it. I, I, congratulations Thanks. on that. Um, outside of HealthWatch and the tools you're using, like Logregator, are there any special tools Dix is using to monitor the infrastructure? Uh, We're working through that. Uh, that was a, definitely our MVP going into holiday, and I think we were focusing on getting things up and running and stable uh, going into holiday uh, and less on monitoring, which hurt us a little bit in the end. Uh, but we're looking at integrating with Prometheus uh, right now. Uh, we're doing some work with uh, Pivotal Support to get that up and running. Uh, and we have a whole CRE organization, Customer Reliability Engineering Organization, that's been stood up. And they're going to be helping the uh, product teams integrate their logging with whatever solution. I think we're, we're, looking at, we're considering Elk. Uh, we're trying to figure out um, where all those logs are going to land. But... Uh, we need something more than 14 days worth of app logs so that uh, they can actually troubleshoot their apps. Thank you. Sure. Anybody else? Great. Thanks awesome. a lot. Thanks, guys.